I'm Walt, and this is Delta Astrophotography. It is June, and that means it's Milky Way season. Milky Way photography is one of the easiest forms of astrophotography because you can do it with just a camera, lens, and a tripod. And of course you have to be in a dark location for this. But if you really want to take your Milky Way photography up a notch or three, you need to invest in a small, simple device called a star tracker. For those of you who are new to astrophotography, a star tracker is a small device like this that you mount your camera on and it will rotate it with the earth, moving with the stars in the sky, making them look like they're standing still, allowing you to do much longer exposures. And that lets you do lower ISOs on your camera so you'll have less noise. You can stop your aperture down. That makes your image look much more sharp. But most importantly, you're letting in a lot more photons, very distant photons. And so your image is gonna look so much more detailed. Right now, there are two very popular star trackers on the market. One is the iOptron Skyguider Pro, like I have, and the other is the Skywatcher Star Adventurer. The Skywatcher seems to have the edge in popularity right now. Most of you who've commented that said you had a star tracker said you had one of those. And I will say the new one definitely has some fancy features that this doesn't have, like built-in Wi-Fi for remote control and also some really cool time-lapse features. But really, they basically both work the exact same. So if you have a star adventure and my videos about the iOptron, you can still follow along. For example, they both have a way to change the speed from solar to lunar and uh, whatnot. But on the Skywatcher, it's a dial as opposed to buttons. For the iOptron, we shoot at 1x for stars. And on the Skywatcher, I think it just looks like a star. If you want to shoot lunar, there's obviously a picture of the moon. If you want to shoot uh, the sun, there's a picture of the sun. And some of you might ask, lunar? Why would I want to track the moon? I don't have to do long exposures. The moon is just so bright. And well, stick around and we might accidentally find out. Hey buddy, you want a pig or you want your pig? You want your pig? Go get your pig. And this is what a basic setup looks like. For smaller lenses, like your kit lenses, the 75 to 300 or the 18 to 55, or the nifty 50 like this, you can mount them directly to the star tracker using a ball head adapter and a ball head. So you can move your camera around in any direction you want. For heavier lenses, like my Tamron 24 to 70, you're gonna to want to use the mounting bracket or green dovetail plate on the Skywatcher and the counterweight kit to help get everything properly balanced because you don't want to put too much stress on the gears and motors in this thing. To balance it, you simply loosen this piece right here, it's the clutch, Just pull it to the side, let it fall. And we can see this side is too heavy. We'll just move the counterweight up until it's balanced. There we go. Now the balance might change when I aim my camera in a different direction, so it's best to test the balance again for example, the Milky Way is actually going to be in this direction. So now let's test the balance. Yeah, it's completely changed. So let's pull that back. And there we go. Now before we add any cameras or mounting brackets, we're gonna have to polar align our star tracker and that is the key to successful star tracking. Basically, we're just gonna look through our polar scope that's built in and inside there's a reticle, a circle, it looks like a clock. And we find the celestial pole here in the Northern hemisphere, it's the North Star, very easy to find. I don't know what it is in the South Pole, guys, I'm sorry. If anybody knows, please leave a comment below. But anyway, yeah, we try to find the North Star and put it inside the circle in here. And we do that by adjusting our altitude or up and down using the altitude knob and left and right by turning the azimuth screws the same direction simultaneously. That moves it left and right. I could spend all day talking about polar aligning but to make this short, I'm just going to give you four polar alignment tips to help you get started. Number one, download a polar alignment app on your phone that will show you where the North Star is going to be inside your reticle. I use Polar Aligner Pro and here's why. Okay, let's check out Polar Aligner Pro. And I guess one of the main reasons I like it is I can tap Polaris right here and where it says scope, I can choose the star tracker or mount that I have. So for example, I have Ioptron, so I'll scroll through these. There, there it is, Ioptron. That's what my reticle looks like inside my star tracker. The white dot is where Polaris should be in your reticle. 
Also, you can hit mount right here and it shows your latitude, which is also very important and I'm about to talk about it. Number two, go ahead and find your latitude and dial that number in right here with your altitude knob. Once you have your latitude dialed in, you can take this thing and point it right up at Polaris, make sure it's right above your star tracker, and that should put you in the ballpark. Number three, and this is most important to me, get a red light of some kind. You see, this star tracker has a light built inside of here so you can see the reticle in your polar scope, but there's a problem. When it's time to mount a camera or anything to it, you have to turn this piece into this position and it turns the light off. Why would you do that? Why can't there just be a switch right here on the side of the star tracker that turns the, the light in here on and off whenever I want? But no, when I need to mount something up here, the light's gone. And trust me guys, this piece is pretty heavy and it's even heavier when you have a camera and a big lens attached to it. You've added a lot of weight to it and you've pulled it down a little bit, which knocks this out of polar alignment. It happens to me every single time. And I wanna repolar align after I've gotten everything set up. And the only way I can see the reticle in here now is by shining a red light down into it like this. Just kind of off to the side, not directly in. And then I can see the reticle again. And finally, try to polar align as early as you can. Don't do it when it's really dark outside because you're gonna look through your polar scope and you're gonna see hundreds of stars and it's gonna be hard to pick out which one's the North Star. But if you do it right when the stars are coming out, when the North Star is one of the few you can see in the sky, that's the best time to polar align. Took me a while to figure that one out. All right, now that we're polar aligned and balanced, we're almost ready to shoot. We just need to frame up, focus, and dial in our camera settings. More about those in a few minutes. If you're just shooting the sky, you're golden. But if you're trying to do a Milky Way landscape or nightscape, then you're gonna have to take your foreground separately. And this is because as the star tracker moves your camera, the ground is gonna blur. And if you're like me and like to stack multiple images for noise reduction, then you're gonna have even more blur ground issues. It's gonna be running up the right side of your photo, kind of like this. A lot of people are kind of strict about how they take their foregrounds. You have to take it in the same location at the same time, and it has to be 100% accurate. And I'm kind of like that, but not quite. I live in the Mississippi Delta where it's very hot, and at, at midnight, there is no way I'm gonna take a long enough exposure to expose a foreground. The heat's just gonna make the noise and the hot pixels terrible. So what I like to do is take my foreground right as the last light is fading. Right around when you would polar line, when you see the very first stars, there's just a hint of light in the sky. A five to 10 second exposure at this time of day should get you a plenty bright enough photo. Now, one thing to look out for is you don't want your entire photo lit up like it's daytime. Those photos where the foreground looks like it was taken at noon or something, I don't find those very believable. Another good time to take your foreground shots is under the light of a full moon or just a really bright moon. The moon is a great soft light, so you can go out somewhere and take your shots under the moon and come back to that same location later in the month and take your Milky Way backgrounds. In my next video, I will tell you in a very easy way to blend a foreground with a Milky Way background. It's a piece of cake. All right, that's enough talking. It's time to get out in the field. Okay, here we are. This is where I'm gonna be for the rest of the night. The last little bit of light of the day and it's getting cloudy. I'm not gonna let that bring me down though. I have hopes that it might clear up. And if I can get five minutes of time with Milky Way later, that, that'll be just fine. But for right now, I better get to shooting the foreground. All right, I did the best I could. If I look all oily or something right now, it's because I had to put on a lot of mosquito spray. They're really bad out here. Now I just have to wait for these clouds and moon to go away. I mean, the clouds are definitely going away, but I think it's still gonna stay hazy for the rest of the night, which sucks. And this moon is getting on my nerves. I hate the moon. You know what? Let's shoot it. Let's shoot the moon. Because I have another camera. This is my Canon 6D I'm gonna shoot the Milky Way with, but this, this is a Canon T5i with a 75 to 300 millimeter kit lens on it. I'm gonna put this on the star tracker and I'm gonna do something a little different for the moon. I'm gonna connect it to a laptop and take a video. Let's see how that turns out. Want a fuller, more in-depth moon tutorial? Subscribe to this channel. Okay, so it's almost midnight. I've set the camera back up. I've repolar aligned, balanced again, and now I've set my camera settings to an ISO of 800, aperture of F4, and I'm gonna do 
three minute exposures. And I'm gonna control that with this little intervalometer. I don't know if you can even see this in the dark, but this is a very handy tool for astrophotography because you can set very long exposures uh, and control it without ever having to touch your camera. So get one of these. I'm gonna set it to take about 60 pictures to stack for uh, noise reduction and, and things like that later. I'm really tired, so I think I'm gonna go ahead and sign off. So I will see you in the morning. As I was tearing down, I looked up and took one last long look at the sky to take in its majestic beauty. And I couldn't help but think about how I haven't seen the Milky Way in a month and I might not see it again for another and how much I needed to take advantage of the little time I had with it that night. So I got out the Nifty 50, and at this time the Milky Way was completely vertical in the sky, so I got to try out a new angle, and I was really pleased with the results. Now that was definitely a late night. I didn't get home till the sun was rising. At the beginning of the night when I was trying to take my nightscape, I was having all kinds of problems with the moon and haziness and humidity, and it created a green kind of color cast in my photo that I had a hard time getting rid of. Not one of my best, but we only get one or two clear nights a month here in the Delta, so I had to take advantage of it anyway. The moon and the other photo, I'm pretty happy with. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you have any questions, please leave me a comment below. And if you like this kind of stuff, definitely leave me a like and hit the subscribe button. That would be awesome. As always, stay spacey, folks. Clear skies and good night.